A quick content note here before we begin this episode of the DMs Book Club. This is our Halloween special episode where we're looking at certain monsters which you can use in your horror one-shots or campaigns or even encounters during the spooky season. Naturally, that means we'll be looking at certain themes to do with horror and we'll be discussing them at great length. So I'm just including content warnings here for body horror, gore, graphic descriptions of death and at least one mention of trypophobia, which is the fear of irregular or regular patterned holes. Do not look it up. Trust me on this one. If these are themes that you're not comfortable with, please take a moment and maybe skip out on this episode for now and come back to us if or when you're ready. Thank you very much and happy spooky season, everyone. And welcome to the DMs Book Club, a podcast we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role playing campaigns. Today, I have another guest on this podcast. I've got the wonderful Derek from How Not to DM, and this is exciting because I have just finished an interview with Derek, and I I just talked for loads of time, so now I'm going to transfer it over to Derek so he can talk loads about himself. Derek, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic, Fiona. How about you? Oh, I, I've, I've talked about myself for an hour and a half just recently, so we don't need to hear about me. Tell us a bit about your podcast. What is How Not to DM? It started as a blog where I thought I would send people a Google Doc with a bunch of questions about their game running style, and they would fill it out and send it back to me, and I'd post it. Uh, it turns out people don't like homework, uh, <laughs> so or you know revising or whatever you may call it. Yep. And so some people answered, some people didn't, and mm-hmm. I asked a friend to be on he said yeah let's do this but let's just record it and then you can you know get a a transcription software and it'll type it out for you and I said okay I'll try that we recorded and then I thought how hard would it be to just post this as a podcast so I literally stumbled into it uh not a lot of effort or forethought there but uh, yeah, it's been going very well. Uh, I've had a lot of interesting guests, including yourself, and it's been fun to talk to people about all the different games they've run, all of their different philosophies on running games, mm-hmm. and their really cool projects they work on too. I love how you were sort of like, oh, I just stumble on and it was easy. I was like, yeah, that's most of podcasting is like that. Like, <laughs> you think everyone's like, look <laughs> at these amazingly edited podcasts. And you're like, yes, but they've had people paid for it. It's not like us people slumming it, just trying to talk to people. And I hope we come across as genuine, interested people and not weirdos who are like just creeping on people's work. (laughs) So That is a major concern is, yeah, the amount of people whose DMs I slide into asking them to to appear or whatever it might be. But yeah, so far, it's so good. I haven't had anyone block me yet. So that's that's what I'm going for. That is promising. So you're a DM yourself, you've run uh, Dungeons and Dragons, or do you run lots of other RPGs? What, what is your sort of, uh, experience? Yeah, that? I started out playing D&D with some co-workers who invited me. I had heard of the game before. I didn't know much about it. I, I think I had probably watched the first season of Stranger Things at this point. Wow. So, okay. you know, it's it was just an idea and it sounded interesting. And growing up, I loved fantasy. I loved sci-fi. I loved all that kind of thing. And so it was an easy game to pick up for me. I loved it a ton. I started off with a a Dragonborn Druid because I took some quiz online and that's what it told me to build. Uh, So maybe not an optimized character, but it was a lot of fun. I didn't get to play too many sessions though before that game group kind of fizzled out. Yeah. So we started playing as co-workers at lunch at work. Uh, This is all pre-pandemic. So -hmm. we would play an hour a day. We played through Lost Mine of Fandelver and I loved it. And within maybe half of that game, I started at home on Google Docs writing my own stuff. I said, oh. Ooh, I'm going to build my own world. I'm going to build my own campaign. So I did a little, maybe like three session one shot uh, for my coworkers after we finished Lost Mine and then have just been running the game for friends and family and, and such ever since. That's amazing. I love the idea of trying to get a full session of D&D done in your lunchtime because that as we all know as dms that that <laughs> has to be it has to be engaging and quick <laughs> like you gotta, yes, yes. gotta engage people from you know who are eating and rolling dice and be like wait what were we doing or getting called away or doing work emails so that that's that's i like that as a as a concept just like hey we're finishing do you wanna do you wanna go play an hour of uh, D? that's 
pretty cool. And writing yeah. your own stuff as well. Going from a very short time going, I'm enjoying this. And now I write my own game. That's amazing. Yep. Oh, I love that. Yeah. As a kid, I didn't like writing, which is funny. And as I've grown up, I have grown to like it more and more. I I just loathed it for some reason. But then my mom started making me do little creative writing projects during the summer to yep. like improve my writing skills. And mm -hmm. so I started writing a series of basically news stories about dinosaurs attacking campsites and stuff like they had escaped from Jurassic Park. So, you know, describing the side of the RV or a uh, caravan totally shredded by claws. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's just, you know, yeah. tween stuff or, you know, like 12 year old stuff or whatever that I was writing. But ever since then, I've just come to enjoy it more and more. And so, yeah, it really captured my imagination, the idea that I could build any world, I could fill it with anything. Yeah. And I could tell these amazing stories with my friends that just definitely sounded like something I wanted to get into. When you were talking before about like you're always sort of into your sci-fi and fantasy, I was like, ah, oh, yes, the foundation work to be a DM is all there. And you just needed mm -hmm. that little push. It's all very serendipitous. Yep. I love that. I am very similar. I have all these different interests and you only needed a little push. And then, oh, turns out I love being a storyteller. I love telling these things. I have all these drawing from all these different inspirations. So that is amazing. But enough of that, Derek, enough. We're here to talk about- Okay, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're here to talk about a particular topic. You've brought with us a very interesting, especially themed topic for today. So what Indeed. are we talking about? So when you approached me, I realized our episode would be releasing near the spooky season of Halloween. And yes. so I proposed- that we talk about horror and scary monsters and terrible fiends to include in your games to freak out your players and have an awesome time. Exactly. So yes, it is the spooky season. Tis the spooky season. Um, Tis the season. As we know, I am going through my horror phase pretty much every single day of the year, but this, but this <laughs> year, but this day, we are definitely doing it for everyone else. So yes, today we're going to be talking about all these different monsters that we find inspiring, almost assembling like a, an ultimate team, a big fantasy team of like, what monsters would we like to use in our games? So yes. with that in mind, Derek, what is your first pick? What is the monster you've brought to this table to discuss? So my first pick is from Folo's Guide to Monsters, page 191, which is the Slithering Tracker. Ugh. And the art on all of these is terrifying, and I love it. Mm -hmm. So the Slithering Tracker is this entity made of water, and it basically is the ultimate machine of vengeance. So it talks about in the book how the ritual to create one is only known by hags, liches, and priests of gods of vengeance. And so you have to hate someone or something enough to go to those groups of people and go through this transformation in order to become one. And basically, they suck the liquid from your body. And so it's only the water and your soul is retained within that water. And then you are this water form that goes and exacts the vengeance upon whoever your target might be. Mm, yes, there's a, a great line in Volos, which just says, yet the mind lives on in the puddle of liquid that issues forth from the remains. And you're like, Ugh, that sounds yeah, awful. <laughs> it does. And the art has this creepy watery face on it too. So it, it's very evocative of that. So yeah, yeah it's, it's basically this ultimate ambush and killing machine. It mm -hmm. talks about in the stat block about how it appears like a puddle of water, if you don't know, and it can climb up walls and ceilings using spider climb. So I envision using it in some sort of encounter in a cave or, you know, in some sort of rainy area where this puddle exists and is waiting for your party. And you could easily slot this in as some family member or friend of someone that the party has killed in the past or wronged in the past because parties tend to stumble around a little bit. And so you could have one or two or however many of these things as these people who have sworn vengeance against your party and are waiting to just essentially drown them and kill them. Quite a lot of the monsters you've picked have this theme of like vengeance. And like, it's very interesting that from a horror aspect is that this anger, this bitterness, this vengeance goes through beyond the grave or goes through to almost a monstrous aspect. And yeah, yeah if you look at the image of this creature, I was getting very uh, John Carpenter, the thing vibes from it. Uh, yes. 
the ways of the again no spoilers because it's also horrific i rec- i do recommend watching it um but just the way that sort of the face sort of comes out of this body and this idea that once it's uh, killed or drowned its victim it sucks the blood out of its victim as well and then when it leaves it leaves that sort of bloody trail behind it because obviously it's just liquid and so that Ugh. visual image of this yes. is just interesting and yes as you said like obviously they are assassins they are focused on one attack to sort of get you know kill the person or or take vengeance but once they've taken vengeance they sort of just go insane because that is their purpose that is Mm -hmm. that that is them done so they'll just start killing indiscriminately so i can absolutely see this as like well there's been a state of murders of just people being found on the floor completely drowned but there's no water nearby just these horrific sort of snail trails of blood leading out and off up the walls and through the floorboards as a result so i oh yeah absolutely insane i also got terminator 2 vibes from this um being able to shape shift and change your shape and fit into small spaces and that kind of thing so it does talk about it appearing as a puddle when it grapples you also this was really interesting whoever it has grappled takes half the damage that it is taking while they are grappled. So it has uh, advantage on the first round of combat if it ambushes you and surprises you. Mm -hmm. It only takes half the damage that you are dealing to it because it has your friend or party member grappled. So it really is a very deadly surprise attack to spring on any kind of party. It's a challenge rating three, Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like you could probably scale it up or down if you needed to, to have it punch above its weight. But yes, certainly a a terrible, scary, strange encounter to throw at any party who maybe have wronged people in the past or something like that. Absolutely. And yeah, just having a quick look as well. Main resistance is obviously uh, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks. So if you're a lower level party and that's all you've got, you know, trying to work out what it's maybe vulnerable to. In this case, it is cold and fire, which I think mm-hmm. makes sort of sense in a way. Maybe fire less so because it's water, but I don't know. I just, again, this idea of that, like you were talking about this like life leech, this idea of being grappled and restrained, like you're underwater and you can see that, but yeah, halving that damage and just oh, everything about it, just it's creepy, uh, it's terrifying, and could be easily a locked room uh, murder mystery puzzle essentially for your party mm-hmm. to go investigate and then realize oh oh no it's it's in the water it's in the goddamn water so <laughs> yeah in the it. pipes or or whatever yeah exactly yeah. exactly that it's funny you mentioned that i picked a lot of vengeance monsters my party is a very good aligned party that i've dm for now and so they don't do a lot of terrible or awful things that i get to exact vengeance on them for mm-hmm. so maybe it's just a little bit of me trying to find things that i would like to use but don't get to use <laughs> uh, interesting you say that i guess because there's always that uh, thing of like oh the dm versus the players and i think with all these monsters we've got i would love to be able to build more encounters around certain monsters so as we've sort of talked about like this idea of a locked room thing this idea that something is coming for the players etc like everything has consequences it's all wrapped up in here so i absolutely love that as a as a way mm-hmm. to to explain it on the party and like yeah so i think a lot of these monsters we talk about you can't just necessarily drop them in. You maybe need a little bit of prep or a plan to sort mm-hmm. of work out how you, you put them in because otherwise it won't have the same effect. It won't have the same impact on them. Right. This is something I would use in a specific situation, not just toss it at them. Although exactly. you could toss it at them just as a monster, but I feel like the fact that it is an, an engine of vengeance really is the defining characteristic of it. So you make a great point there. I think also it, its strength and dex stats and its stealth stats are interesting. So stealth plus eight. Mm-hmm. Dex is a plus four, strength is a plus three. So it is no slouch and is very easy for it to hide. And it mm-hmm. even has um, advantage on stealth underwater. So yeah, mm-hmm. a lot of interesting places you could use it and hide it very easily from even a very discerning party. As you sort of spoke about, it has spider climbs, so that idea of like everyone looking and then do the horror thing of looking up as something, yeah, almost starts to spool down from the ceiling like a snake or like yeah. a horrible goop. Because it is, it is an ooze as well, as it is described. Mm-hmm. So, ugh. Yes, it is. Fiona, what's your first monster you've got for us? All right, all right. So you've come out the gate strong. I'll give you that. And I will say that <laughs> I 
not cheated. I've just gone unused one book uh, <laughs> as a result of this. But hey, I think it happens to have a lot of horrific monsters in it, to your credit. It does. It, it is made for this, I guess. All the monsters I've picked are from Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Obviously, you know, it's a great book. Love it. And it has I, supplanted Tasha's in your, in it, your uh, favorite book, right? It, it is. Yes, it is. It's number one. Although Wild Beyond the Witchlight is pretty good as well, I guess. But I've always been a horror girl. Like I said, like I celebrate spookiness 365 days a year, but especially on Halloween, I guess. Um, and yes, yeah, Slivering Tracker, that's really good. But what about, what about just horrible blood? Right. And I know I'm going to get this name wrong. So I will tell you what page it's on first. So it's on page 238 of Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. We are talking about the Necrocore, which essentially is a being of living blood formed from the ichor of evil gods or in the sludges of crypts of liches. As with all these things, there's a horrific illustration of this, like basically like a vial of some sort, like a, almost like, a, I would say, like a cloning chamber with sort of almost yeah. wards and sigils on it with this horrific sort of being of blood with a face sort of creeping out of it and yeah i'm getting proper venom vibes from this creature this idea mm, that mm-hmm. again like you said it's slides across the floor it infects the blood there's this it has an ability called blood puppeteering which essentially it just takes over a creature and just uh, controls its movement action or both reminds me of blood bending from avatar exactly all, all these sort of things yeah. it. but it is pretty horrific so I'll, I'll just read out for it so it's they've proven difficult to destroy since they always leave a trace of their essence within the veins of every creature they've controlled and can regenerate themselves from those creatures blood so that idea again that whole thing about being infected if it's like a zombie bite or being cursed with vampirism that idea that as soon as you know one touch one bite one scratch and that's it you're gone this idea that they are just uh, I can't describe it in a way, but just again, that idea they can climb over walls, they can, they have pseudopods that are a little bit like um, oozes in a way. But this idea of blood puppeteering, so it just is controlled and attaches itself for the whole thing. And again, that idea of half damage to it again, maybe more of a hardcore slivering tracker because it has legendary resistances. And yeah, just this image of blood coming up and just taking over your body, just mm, disgusting. <laughs> Yeah, any kind of thing where it's you, but you don't have control over your own body freaks me out. So Mm -hmm. as a player, this would be terrifying. Mm. Like looking at it, like it has something called rejuvenation, which means unless this remains a splash of holy water or placed in a vessel under the effects of the hallow spell, it will reform and regain all of its hit points and appear in the place where it died. So it is a very tough creature. It is, I think, was it, it Channel Rating 7? But the fact that mm. it will keep coming back unless you destroy it in the proper way. Again, that idea of having a ritual to cleanse the place, good and evil, that sort of thing, just tying into that. So I can imagine like your party going down, say, even to like Tomb of Horrors, for example. The Lich is no longer there. Aserak is no longer there. But there is these uh, necrocores just hiding in certain places and coming and just blood puppeteering or just taking over the bodies just ugh, no yeah it, it does mention that they kind of show up from the place or if they're from ichor of evil gods or the sludge of crypts of failed liches so it could be a very interesting place to put them but yeah I, I think that a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today a lot of these monsters are best for parties that have clerics or have cleric friends because a lot of them need abilities like that to counter the things they do, right? You need to hallow the thing that you're holding it in or you need some holy water to destroy it. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and again, looking at some of the skills as well, like resistance to acid and necrotic, which makes sense. Uh, Immune it's got, to all conditions. Yeah, all conditions. Yeah, I can't imagine you know. Like, and now this creature is prone. I mean, it's blood. It's not. It's not going to be prone. Yep. Any free languages and telepathy. So I again, the idea of the venom sort of like talking to it and having a persona in some way and being able to speak in different languages, but only in your mind is just whoa. The juiciest of role play, absolutely, as a sort of villain or two going around the battlefield, essentially. Yeah, really, really yeah. enjoy that. All right, so those are our first two contenders. Derek, what is your next monster? What else have we got? All right, next up, I have the Helmed Horror. This is Monster's Manual, page 183. Oh. So the Helmed Horror is essentially a souped-up version of your animated armors, 
Mm. And the thing that is most interesting to me about it is uh, some of the the sections uh, it talks about here. So tactical cunning, a helmed horror fights with the cunning of a skilled warrior taking to the air as it attacks weaker characters and spellcasters first. However, a helmed horror lacks the insight to change its environment, fortify it, or otherwise take active measures to improve its defensive position. So I think that's interesting. I know you've talked to Keith Amon and is, you know, about his book, Monsters Know What They're Doing. And I think this is an excellent mm-hmm. example of that. It knows that these spellcasters and these squishier backliner characters are the ones that it wants to target first. So it just runs through your barbarians, your fighters, your paladins, it doesn't care. It's going for the weaker and mm-hmm. the squishier characters first. So I think that's a very interesting point about it. Uh, it's got 20 AC, 60 hit points. It is a challenge rating four. So at level four, 20 AC is quite high. You're not going to see high. a lot of mm-hmm. enemies with that. It also has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. And it's um, got quite a few condition immunities as well. So quite the terrifying thing to throw at a level four party who is probably, you know, has probably fought a few goblins and and whatnot (laughs) up to this point, right? Uh, Is Mm. this is um, kind of a much scarier, smarter thing that they're going to have to contend with. Absolutely. And I think, again, the thing that makes it stand out from just animated armor, and I think a lot of times I do think we go for the animated armor, say, oh, it looks very cool. So, but the thing about this helmed horror thing is I just underneath before the actions is magic resistance so obviously has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects which makes sense because you probably want to be further away from it shooting at it but those two little words saying spell immunity uh the helm horror is immune to three spells chosen by its creator and then it just says typically fireball heat metal and lightning bolts and you're like yeah "Hmm." the three that you would use (laughs) absolutely and i think that's that is so smart i think i like having constructs or like if it's something that has been created in some way that's been an evil genius and this is like a mini boss fight per se you'd have mm-hmm. this on the way to go defeat the big bad they have been developed to be like oh you're gonna try and heat metal because everyone you know everyone at a certain level has heat metal because it's really fun because you're like haha if you say this does not work and you go what but it's made of metal like, we know the evil genius who created this knew this would happen <laughs> And I just, oh, yeah. as, a, as a way to sort of mess with your players a little bit, I, I think that's great. And again, the imagery of this, like, it looks very much like, again, I can't remember off the top of my head what the creature was called, but in Thor, the sort of big yeah. giant robots sort of thing, again, the way it sort of lights up with the, with the fire and that sort of look looks, oh, it looks incredible. It looks so stylized as well compared to maybe other animated armors, which is just like, oh, it's just a normal suit. This one has clearly been created and designed to be, the mini boss, you know, it looks like it. You see that coming, you're like, this is it. The music plays, the invisible wall comes behind you, you're ready to fight, you know? <laughs> yeah. If I were a terrible DM, which I am, I would probably throw two of these mm-hmm. as minions of the boss in the throne room or something like that, right? They may be standing beside the throne or they're the guard statues right next to the doors as you enter in and then attack from behind. Cause then that would give them very easy access to those kind of backliner characters. Maybe you like have them show up at the end of initiative on the first round or something. So that's the type of terrible stuff I put my players through. But yeah, I I love the the Thor reference. That's kind of the vibes I got from this too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might I might describe it as having only two terrible glowing eyes or something like that yes. also just cuz I think that's creepy cuz when you've killed it there's nothing inside but it did have those weird eyes or something like that. But yeah, terrible terrifying thing mostly because like you said it may appear like it it will be an easy fight at the beginning until they hit those immunities and those spells mm-hmm. that aren't working and then realize how difficult it's going to be to kill this thing. Yeah, I guess because again, animated armor, I know I keep coming back to it, animated armor, animated swords and shields, they're quite common. I think, again, it's an early thing. If you're in a dungeon or you're in a castle or something, it makes sense to have it. Whereas you have something like this guarding it, maybe again, that false sense of security is, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, everything about it, that spell immunity thing, I'm just like, ooh, that could be used yeah. for other things as well. Hmm. Yes, you could. You could homebrew and add that to anything if you wanted. But Truly a terrifying encounter, in my opinion. Mm. All right, Fiona, that's my uh, second to bat. So who do you have or what do you have for us? All right. All right. Okay. So we're talking about something that's been made, right? There's been a creator of some sort. I'm going to go from the, oh, God, this is really, this is really scary. Big fight. Something. Oh, this doesn't look like it's going to hurt. Oh, God, no. I'm going to talk about the carionette. This... (laughs) 
awful, awful thing. And I will be the first to admit, I find dolls creepy. I find Ooh. children creepy. I find anything that is a toy. Like you, you think like you think about your Toy Story when you had Sid making his like you know Frankenstein monster creations. This is what we're talking Doctor, about. Doctor, you've done it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Oh. So yeah, so it starts off that I mean, I have to say, all these stat blocks, they're all beautifully written and they're very evocative and they give you that flavor. So it just starts off by saying, carionettes arise from innocent intentions. Heartfelt wishes breathe life into a beloved toy, and for a time, the creator might feel blessed by their new companion. But they're not content to live as toys and seek to escape the confines of their diminutive bodies. And so there's, a, a, again, a great picture where it looks like a, a ballerina on a penny farthing uh, that, again, with a very awful face. Just look at the image. It's terrifying, but it can be anything. It could be a stuffed doll. It could be a stuffed animal. Anything like that can be a carionette. It's just all about flavoring. So I think you've got a wide range of variety there. But the key thing is, and this is the key storytelling thing, is that every carionette possesses a silver needle that pins its soul to its body. And it does an attack where it's just called soul swap. And if you are targeted by this creature, when you are pinned by it, it swaps souls with you. And your soul is then now trapped inside the carionette as the carionette continues on to be yourself. And we've all heard of like evil versions of ourselves, you know, and people going, no, don't do it. So you're getting images of Chucky, the idea of mm-hmm. gremlins. There's definitely, are you afraid of the dark episode, which people were trapped in Tamagotchis, you know, that sort of thing. This idea that something happens, you're in a toy shop and your companion stops and then they're like, oh, and they carry on and you just leave behind a small stuffed teddy bear screaming to be like, no, don't go with them. Just, ah. Uh. Yes. Yeah, I also got body snatcher vibes from this too. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but what did mm-hmm. you think of it as a, as a creature? I am like you. I think dolls are incredibly creepy. I think um, my wife's grandmother has a collection of them and I just don't even want to go into that part of the house because they're all on the wall staring at you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I... I think that the whole soul swap thing, again, a lot of potential for role play. And this is something where you could text your player about this before it's going to happen and say, hey, I'm going to swap your soul for this evil doll. You're going to play an evil doll soul for this encounter or whatever until the party figures it out. So much, uh, so much potential there. And players love when you get to do like a little thing between you and the DM, you know, and, and I love it too when I'm a player. So I feel like there's a lot of potential for something like that here. You know what? That is really smart. I think because I've definitely been in games when somebody has taken over my character or I've taken another person's character as DM and the DM has done it all out. So obviously then the player's like, well, definitely there's something wrong because Graham's not speaking, it's Fiona. Right. So the idea that you it happens, you go, okay, we're going to take a quick break, tell them that this is what happens, you know, and then the players have to figure it out. Because it talks about like when it happens, the uh, the target is unconscious for an hour and then gains control of the carionette body. So they're not necessarily back straight away. And mm-hmm. this idea that if the, the carionette's body is destroyed... Uh, both the carinet and the target die. So the carinet doesn't want to like, get rid of that body because obviously that's no good for them, but they might have to take it with them or hide it in some place. Yeah, it's you only- hear a faint muffled scream while you're sleeping at night because there's this doll in your companion's bag uh, yeah. with with their soul inside of it that's just like, help, let me out. Because Yeah, because that's, yeah. that's true because obviously a party member will be like, oh God, an animated creature and try and kill it probably because obviously yeah, prob- probably. It's, it's, it's probably a terrifying looking object as well but the idea that the only way to to re-switch souls is either through like cast good and evil on the actual controlled body or by by the carrying that silver needle so again the idea of like it's on the player to be like ah, ah, rushing up with the needle like stab but like trying to get it whereas obviously the carionette in the new body will be very aware of this and probably avoiding it all cost going oh it's really it's attacking me oh somebody stop it please it's it doesn't know what it's doing and just that horrible sort of um oh i love i love that in a part yeah. of the trail i'm all here yep. for that <laughs> <laughs> right write it down and again you need your cleric right protection from good and evil so make sure you bring one along oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah and just, yeah. just looking at all the different kinds so yeah so i said marionettes and porcelain dolls are the most common can be anything so stuffed animals crawling jack-in-the-boxes uh yeah. poppets 
murderous jewelry box ballerinas. I'm just like toy it, soldiers. Yeah. Oh, just oh, like again, if you want to be like, oh, it's a Barbie doll or something like that. Like Cindy, it's like she's gone. She's gone completely crazy. Oh, just, oh. Everything about that again, getting real Chucky vibes. That idea, like you know, like toy soldiers. Absolutely, that's another like less horror film, but like the idea that you're having to do stuff and to, to switch bodies and stuff. Ugh, absolutely, and your feet are stuck together on the little pedestal or whatever. Yeah, yeah you've got. Oh yeah, yeah you could yeah, again just just through that play, but you can really develop stuff saying, oh, we can only move at. 10 feet around or something because your body is like this you can only do certain actions you maybe can't lift your arms above your head because that's not how the body works so you could do a one shot where all of you are turned into puppets as well like in a house oh, that would be interesting oh, you all no. go into the house and you sleep and then you all wake up and you're all dolls and you got to figure out how to get out of the doll bodies oh mate mate that will go blah. <laughs> oh I see. I, I'm like, this is really cool. And I'm like, oh no, they're all dolls. Oh no, I'm the only human. I'd be like the Michael Caine in this Muppet film. Just like, oh no. Anyway, enough about creepy dolls. What else have you got for me, Derek? Okay, I kind of cheated for my next one, but <gasps> I make no apologies. Uh, okay. I chose all of the slot. Yes, so you did. It's, <laughs> it's it's a whole group of terrifying frogs. It's funny because there, I feel like there are three different kinds of frog humanoids in D and D lore. There's Slod, and then you've talked about oh, what are they called? Uh, oh, um, in one of your previous grungs, episodes, Grungs. Grungs, yes, that was an early one. So good memory. Uh, and then there's also Bullywugs. Bullywugs, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know if you can play as those, but it's just funny. I, I know that the lore is kind of a mishmash of a lot of different mm. people's books and games and whatnot. So, but yes, Slod. Uh, yes. There are a few pages worth of stuff in the Monster Manual. We're starting on page 274 for those mm. keeping track at home. I chose the Slod because I feel like they're an incredible combination of terrible beasties Mm. And they remind me of, again, Body Snatchers, but also Alien. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you'll love this, Fiona, because they have actually been created by Primus, the overlord of Modrons. Yes, so, I saw you did that. Yay. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you would like that. I did. Uh, so it says here, long ago, Primus, overlord of the Modrons, created a gigantic geometrically complex stone imbued with the power of law. And he cast it adrift in limbo. So kind of an interesting idea, but basically he was trying to send this stone of law into limbo to mm. uh, limit the chaos that comes from limbo and try to limit the chaos effects on the rest of the multiverse, which is kind of an interesting idea. So being from the plane of order, you know, from the plane where the Madrans are, that's, you know, that's kind of what he was going for. But yeah. instead of it working like he expected, this stone he sent in absorbed some of this chaotic energy, which then birthed these terrible frog-like beings. Yeah, it's an incredible origin story. It feels proper Marvel in a way, like very yeah. Thanos trying to solve a problem which people don't want and stuff. And yeah, the, the fact that trying to create order in chaos, we know chaos is not going to want that. And so, yeah, as a result, these horrific creatures of chaos and evil coming out and then killing all these uh, enclaves of modrons that happen to be like oh we're living in limbo now hello friend ah let's get completely ripped apart as a result and i know we say this every time we look at moss but these images these drawings of slard they are creepy they are, they do look like upright frogs but on two legs and they look like they can pack a punch as well Yes, they have terrifyingly long, creepy limbs and claws, and they have a very weird way that they reproduce, which yep. is very alien-esque, like I said. So that's what we'll talk about that next. So birth and transformation. Slotty have horrific cycles of reproduction. Slotty reproduce either by implanting humanoid hosts with eggs mm -hmm. or by infecting them with a transformative disease called chaos phage. Mm -hmm. So depending on the type of slot you get attacked by, and if you fail your constitution throw, you will be infected by this disease or you have eggs of a nasty chaotic frog race implanted inside of you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you eventually become the host for a tadpole that bursts out of your chest and you die or yep. you just transform into one of these things if you have the disease. So a lot of creepy body horror again. Mm -hmm. You could get very descriptive with, you know, this thing writhing under your flesh or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but not a lot of options if you fail these con saves and then you're you know you're done for Absolutely. you turn into one of these things 
and again, I'm going to get this completely wrong, but there is a, a sort of toad that has its eggs on its back, almost like, and again, I'm not going to describe in too much detail because you might have, but I think it's trichophilia. So that idea of fear mm. of organized holes. If you look at these frogs or these toads, they had that on their back, essentially full of eggs. So that's what I have in my head. Like the image, there's a great drawing of this tadpole coming out of someone's chest, but the idea of just having something worming on the back and then just growing as this huge hole and yep we're both creeped each other out there that's cool anyway um yes we have maybe you put a content warning at the beginning uh, of the episode there's, oh, so there's, there knows. is definitely good. we're talking about body horror we're going to talk about all these yeah. things but yes that's yes. their sort of reproductive cycle is very interesting so yes yeah, so i you know through this um certain uh slides reproduce certain other slides and this idea that reds do uh, I'm going to get this wrong now, but yeah, do you want to describe that? It, it says it at the beginning. Yeah. Yes. So it says that red spawn blue or green, blue spawn red or green. And the difference is that green slot come from people who know spells. So it says if you know up to Ooh. a third level spell, then you become a green slot because they have a spell casting ability. So that's why you would turn into one of those as opposed to one of the other colors. So those are kind of the lower level slot. Mm-hmm. If you are a green slot, eventually you study and learn enough to make this strange transformation into a gray slot. It says that it doesn't really describe it, but it says you unlock the means to magically instantly and permanently transfer into a, or transform into a gray slot. Then the gray slot are even scarier and stronger. Um, Interesting note, the green and the gray slot can shape change. So they can appear as the humanoid that they came from or were birthed from. Mm -hmm. And then the gray slot once they eat, well, the the top of the pyramid here is the death slot, and they yes. are the worst of all. And the only way to create a death slot is from one of them dying and one of the gray slot eating their corpse and then becoming them. So not a, not many at the top. I'm sure it's lonely at the top. <laughs> but let's talk about that shape changer stuff. So mm. I envision, again, it, it doesn't have to be a one shot, but a whole town worth of people who all are just slightly off or maybe half a town, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's kind of concerned about certain people they meet because they seem a little bit off. They're not exactly acting like themselves. And that's because somewhere there's an incursion from limbo and the slot have made it through and are slowly but surely replacing the town Ooh. with more slot, but then shape changing back into themselves mm. so that the, the people that they're feeding on stay around and don't leave. And so the party shows up. There's this weird vibe in town and people you know some people are acting strange. Some aren't. And that's because half of them are slot. That's that's kind of what I would. Uh, that's what I would do with these things. I love that as an idea. Like I'm thoroughly creeped out by it, but loving it. I think, yeah, that idea of maybe going back to a, a player's town, like, hey, you're passing through. Oh, but things are different. Ooh, you know, that idea a that- player's town. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rather than, the, and you connect it to it, and to then they've got only a certain amount of time before maybe the whole player's family has been taken over. And this, yeah, because of the way the structure is, so you, you've got your greens, blues, reds, and then greys, and then deaths. I- I love this idea of the hierarchy. So we've, as you sort of mentioned, Grungs, in their little thing, there is a hierarchy of some sort, creating some sort of hierarchy, maybe even having two grey slad about to take over. And there is like an elderly death slad, or there is, the, or they're planning to kill the leader and who can get there first. All, you know, all this sort of politics structure, whilst, you know, the, the players come stumbling in going, oh, this town is not what it used to be. Feels very much like Hot Fuzz, if you've ever watched Hot Fuzz. Yes, um, yes. The idea is that, you know, it's like the greater good uh, and having that people turn and then realizing it is all we slad who are trying to just like, ah, we're, we're just trying to extend our things. And just, I, I have this image in my head of like a lovely old lady, like your, your granny or something like that and her face sort of contorts and then you have the big sort of bulbous chin, the smile goes up way too wide and like horrible, uh, you know, like the teeth. Starts croaking. Off. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all these old, all yeah. these old grannies at the bowling club or at the knitting club or something, everyone's turning to you and everyone's listening in and they're all slad. Oh, that would be terrible. Yeah. Uh, again, well, I mentioned the alien part and the body snatchers part, but you mm. you said you you weren't much of a Twilight person in your vampire phase, but she wrote another book that became a movie called The Host. Never yes. read the book. Yes. Haven't read any of her books, but my partner and I, before we were married, for some reason on one date night, decided to watch that movie. It is wow. terrible. Yeah. But it's, it's about like these little alien beings basically 
replacing the human brain with their own and then mm. you can't really tell who's who and anyway that's that's kind of what it reminded me of terrible movie but if you want like a really bad sci-fi movie to watch you should watch it yeah i remember that coming out like um yeah stephanie meyer i remember the book coming out and yep. yeah i remember that and what that links me to again because everything is always connected is that animorphs because the big bad in that was mm. a similar sort of thing was like that this worm would go in it was a bit more mind oh, what were they called as far as I got, I was my colleagues and I were just rem- reminiscing about this really? the other day. Oh. I don't remember, but yeah, there's like the weird centaur looking thing, and that's the good things. And then there's the little yeah, the, the weird the alien brain. thing that what gives them called? all the powers and stuff. But that's for another anyway. time. You, everyone should check out Animorphs. To be fair, it is it is a pretty wacky '90s show and book series. I highly highly recommend it. Yeah, as children of the '90s, I'm sure you and I read our fair share of those. Oh yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. So we're talking about body snatching and about replacing a half a village. Fiona, what do you have that's going to top that? Well, I don't think I have anything to top that. Just something very similar, but in a different format of topping that. <laughs> so you've mentioned body snatches before. Now I'm thinking of like maybe Little Shop of Horrors, the idea of a plant giving you whatever you want. I'm going to talk about the body taking plant and the podling. So again, if you uh, know the story of the Little Shop of Horrors, this idea of this plant that comes from an alien world and makes promises saying that, well, I can give you all that you want. Uh, you just need to feed me in some way and obviously gets bigger and bigger and it turns out it's evil all along who knew very similar thing this idea of having a malicious vegetation taking over and it's just again the way the copy is it talks about an invasive organism that is planning to subvert the whole of society slowly but surely you're thinking of that the red weed from War of the Worlds, that sort of thing, it's slowly creeping in, taking over, uh, consuming individuals and replacing them with duplicates called podlings. My favourite line in this whole thing is their philosophy. It says, to their minds, a world would be healthier and more efficient if they were in control. Anyone who disagrees <laughs> either lacks perspective or is, is fit to only serve as fertiliser. What a, what a policy. I would join this team. <laughs> like, like this idea of would like... Would you now? <laughs> oh, but I think it's that sort of thing where you'd be like, yes, we want to green energy, climate change, all that sort of thing. If you don't agree with us, you're only fit to be fertilizer. Take them. <laughs> like, So again, they're from Van Richten. They're on page 227. I'm learning all sorts of things about you, Fiona. This is, this is very interesting. Hey, hey, Derek. Welcome. Welcome. You have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea that they only have they have telepathy but also deep speech so again it's horrible guttural snarls they are clearly creatures from the beyond so again very Cthulhu vibes in them how would I do a plant voice I'm I, I would have to yeah. think about that that's interesting though Mm, I would struggle with this actually because obviously in my head I'd want them to talk I would want them to be like Little Shop of Horrors I want them to be like mm. Audrey too Ooh. but maybe not do you ever play Halo yes it reminds me of Gravemind, the thing that controls all of the flood. Yes. You could absolutely. even have like a giant mother body taker plant that is the thing that controls all of the rest of them if you wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah. It could be almost like their own version of a mind flare colony, but as a body taker thing, you have the master plant or the master flower in a way. And so what is the, the main thing of this thing? As we say, again, in a great image on 226 of this creature trapping um, somebody in its sort of uh, pods essentially it has an action called entrapping pod on a hit it pulls the target into the space and envelops it and whilst it's there the target is restrained and has total cover it must immediately succeed on a 16 constitution saving throw or be stunned so again this idea of a venus flytrap that's just like got you and slowly but surely dissolving you over the next hour. So if you're, obviously you're, I see this as a creature that that attacks you when you're on your own, when you're sleeping with your party, it's like taking you away. Or if you go off to, as all the veteran parties do, go off for a wee break. And you're like, oh, they'll be back soon, and then they're not, and they go missing. And over several hours, they get, I think it's a level of exhaustion as well, until they die, and then they immediately emerge from the pod as a living podling. So again, that whole invasion of the body snatchers thing, where they just appear back out and obviously return and know everything that person knows in life. But what I love, and Wizard of the Coast do this all the time, and I, I, I say about it, they, you know, there's tables for everything. The idea that there's something clearly not quite right with this replacement, and you have a podling behavior table. 
So you have yeah. stuff like he doesn't do any of the hobbies or, or habits that the person was doing. So if it was something that bit its nails, it probably wouldn't do that out of nervousness. Um, my favorite one is that it relishes exposing its skin to sunlight. It resents clothes <laughs> and hair. So again, just like, again, maybe uh, as you were sort of saying, like if you tell your player, again, at this point, there's no returning for that player. So they're going to be a podling um, saying to them, hey, do you fancy having some fun? It, or if it's a one shot or something like that, then having that idea that like they're in on the joke in the way and just say, they're like, oh yeah, I don't need hair anymore. Isn't it glorious? The sun. Yeah. Just soaking it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, these are funny and they would lead to some very interesting role play. Again, you could have a whole town where half of them have been infected and half the town's acting weird mm-hmm. and they're doing these things. I feel like this kind of table would be really good for any kind of sort of body snatching stuff you're planning on doing and you mm-hmm. can adjust it obviously some of these are plant specific but lots of interesting ideas but yeah it also talks about lavishing affection on plants and views house plants with excessive sympathy so all yes. of a the sudden they've become a huge gardener you know out of the blue no one knows why hey i don't know if you've seen a lockdown people have gone i love plants and suddenly their whole living room's full of plants i'm just saying I'm just saying guilty like, yeah guilty there you go. i bought so many plants <laughs> yep and the final thing to note really about the body taker plan is similar to the, the necrocore. When it dies, it returns to life in the place where it died 1d12 months later, unless the ground where it took root is sown with salt or poison. There's a ritual that goes with it. So the idea that this is like almost like um something that comes Recurring. back. Like, yeah. So yeah. like thinking like anything in Stephen King or S, so like it or or anything that's like every couple of years, this thing comes back until it is defeated, but then it comes back because they still don't know how to uproot it. They don't have any gardeners in your town or something. I don't know. Yeah, the root's still down there or the seed is still germinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've talked about houseplants. We've talked about body doubles and stuff. What else have you got for us, Derek? What is next? Okay, we're going back to Volos. This time we're looking at the Devourer. This is Whoa. on page 138. Mm-hmm. Funny fact about this one, I was talking to my partner saying, what should I pick for these monsters? And she was playing a druid and had needed the dinosaur stat blocks that are on the next page. And she <laughs> said, what was that terrible thing that was on the other page of next to the dinosaurs? You should pick that. And so shout out to her because she hated it. She covered it up with another book so that she wouldn't have to stare at it the whole game. So yes, The Devourer, the first paragraph of text I love. It says, Mm -hmm. of all the abominations Orcus has unleashed, devourers are among the most feared. These tall, mummy-like fiends wander the plains, consuming souls, and by example, spreading Orcus's creed of replacing all life with everlasting death. Uh, And it mentions tall there. Later on in the text, it it explains they're actually eight feet tall. So these terrible husk beings of death that Mm. wander around the plains. They're not necessarily small or, you know, regular humanoid size. They're actually enormous. Yeah. And you can see in the picture, there's like a a smaller humanoid reaching out from its rib cage. I think that's the part that my partner hated the most. So I I agree Um, with your partner. That looks, yeah, I hadn't clocked. It's eight feet tall. Cause to me, that's like the size of maybe a small child, just the way it looks on the page. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought too. If that's eight feet tall. Oh no. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I don't know why it looked like something from, have you seen Total Recall, the original with mm. Arnold Schwarzenegger? Mm. The I don't remember what they're called, but like the ruler or the, the leader of the resistance has this conjoined twin on its stomach. Oh, and that's kind of the yes. vibes, the, the imagery that I got from it. Anyway, ugh, ugh. these things are so terrible because they are incredibly powerful. So challenge rating 13, mm-hmm. immune to poison resistant to cold fire and lightning which are very common spells that people are going to be using especially at high levels you've got your lightning bolts your fireball Mm -hmm. um that cone of cold that kind of thing that your spellcasters would probably try to use it's got multi-attack and in the attack the multi-attack it says that it uses two claw attacks and either imprison soul or soul rend the claw Mm -hmm. attacks are plus 10 12 damage on average and then Imprisoned Soul or Soul Rend are two really terrifying actions mm. that it can take. So Imprisoned Soul, well, I think Soul Rend, is, I would explain first. So it yeah. creates a vortex of life-draining energy within a 20-foot radius of itself. It's an 18 con save, or you take 44 necrotic damage. Um, 
and you increase the damage by 10 for each living humanoid with zero hit points in the area. Whoa, I did not yes. talk about last line. What? Yes. Oh. Now, once someone is down to zero hit points, because chances are that that's going to happen with something so strong as this, it then could use Imprison Soul on its next turn in conjunction with those two claw attacks. And this is what it says here. The Devourer chooses a living humanoid with zero hit points that it can see within 30 feet. The creature is teleported inside the Devourer's ribcage and imprisoned there. And once you're in there, you have disadvantage on death saving yeah. throws and it regains 25 hit points for itself. So you're trapped inside. You have disadvantage on death saves. It gains health. So it's going to be even harder to kill for the rest of your party who are still out there. And then on its next turn, if it has absorbed someone, it gets twice the actions. So four claw attacks and then two soul rends or a soul rend and an imprisoned. So it scales faster yeah. and faster as more people are down. Yeah. Uh, when you're inside of it, if you die, depending on how many hit dice you have left, you yes. come back as a zombie, a ghoul, or a white once you have failed all of your death saves. So you just are immediately created into some terrible servant of undeath and then you are at, under its control. I love this thing. I haven't used it, but no. having read this, I am very excited for the chance I get to, to use it at some point in time. Yeah, this is something where a couple of bad rolls, the party is, compl it's a TPK. Yeah, to happen. easily. Yeah, that idea that you're coming back as either a zombie, a ghoul, or white because of the, the hit die. And again, you know, it's a challenge rating 13. They're going to be high level. They're probably have had a short rest but they're not going to be down to two hit die they're definitely going to be more than that so yeah the fact that it can spawn powerful very powerful minions that will also be attacking the party is is terrifying and you're saying that yeah armor class 16 so that's uh, can be hit but hit points at oh, level 13 yeah but uh, but hit points is like uh, over 170 and so if you're whacking away at this creature but it can on each turn, use uh, Imprison Soul. I see this as a running thing. You need to run away from this creature at top speed. So the only thing I'd say as a DM, there's a little bit of more um, admin to think about. So looking at that, I guess, because if you didn't want to give it away per se, because obviously the whole surprise of that, well, you're trapped in its ribs now, and then you've died now. How many hit do you have? You know, I guess I think just I think just carefully planning it a little bit, because I see this more as a... a one versus party thing rather than several of these creatures so really playing it <laughs> cleverly as a result yeah yeah it's funny you mentioned that because it mentions in the text as well that zombies skeleton schools ghasts and shadows are particularly attracted to yes. its presence so mm. i do see it as an individual kind of thing but you could also throw an army of undead after them because it has already done this and has mm. already taken over a bunch of people's souls and, and begun to terrorize the area it's in. So I yes. might I might pull the fourth edition rule of minions where they just yes. have one hit point. So it only takes one attack to down them just because, mm. like you said, the admin of trying to keep track of five different undeads and yeah. it and all of its abilities, it could be a lot for you. But if you're throwing it at your party, hopefully you've been DMing a while and, and can kind of handle that sort of thing. I, but yeah, it would be terrifying. Yeah, I love that idea, actually. Again, that idea of, I, in my head, I vision it almost like the trolls uh, going towards Helm's Deep. Mm. That you've got all these little, little mini things that you're you're hacking slash and you're trying to get through, but it's this big thing that's coming in the distance. And maybe uh, if we're talking about story hooks, this idea of the town being sieged and you just see this creature coming because it's been sent by Orcrus to be like, this is a holy place and we're going to destroy it all and everything alive here is becoming undead. That sort of mantra coming out. Again, when you're in those sort of levels, the high level play, you know, you are the heroes that have to come and save the town. And is it you get that choice of do you go try to save the rest of the world or do you save this one town? You know, do you leave it to their, their death? And again, that could be a really interesting, like, good versus evil. It could. The origin of it is interesting as well. Uh, just really quickly, mm. uh, it talks about how it is granted to only kind of Orcus's best lieutenants, lieutenants. Yeah. And it takes the soul of a lesser demon to power it in its first foray into another realm. So if I had some sort of demon that had been assailing the party up to this point. It could be that that demon has decided to take this step and, you know, pledge fealty to Orcus or something to become this thing to challenge them even further or, you know, become stronger because it has been defeated by the party in the past. So kind of a, an escalating stakes or it, it has become even stronger having made this terrible deal. 
more terrible being sucked in and dying and you know being created into a ghost instead a lot of a lot of tpk potential like we said mm -hmm. what what do you have to follow up that zombies uh <laughs> perfect <laughs> yes i had to think about this and a lot of the stuff i've picked obviously like inspired from classic horror stories and stuff and we all love a good zombie film. We've loved stuff like uh, Day of the Dead. I love like uh, Shaun of the Dead. It's obviously the comedy version, all that sort of thing. But one of my favorite films I've always enjoyed is Train to Busan and all like books like World War Z and this idea of this oncoming force. Like it's not about the individuals, it is about the clot essentially. So in Van Richten's in page 254, there is a lovely image of what is a zombie clot. This sort of a ball of people, again, all Ugh. reaching out. So again, walking dead style, that sort of thing where these things are just clomb together, essentially clomb as a word. It, the reason I sort of say this, and like zombies, most people will know they have obviously this undead fortitude thing. So when they're put to zero hit points, they do a constitution saving throw with a DC of five plus the damage taken. So it could literally be maybe just, you know, a couple, if it was on its final legs, just maybe one, so it might be six, but it could be all the way up to maybe 24 or something like that. And if it is successful, it drops to one hit point instead. So the fact is like, we oh, killed it. You haven't, it's back. And that's always terrifying. But the action of flesh and tomb so the zombie flings a detached clump of corpses at you, like woof, uh, within 30 feet. Uh, you've got to make a strength saving throw or take 16 bludgeoning damage. And if the target is a large or smaller creature, which fun fact, most of your party will be, uh, it becomes entombed in dead flesh. Uh, you are then restrained, have total cover against all attacks and effects outside the dead flesh. And you take 10 necrotic damage at the start of each turn. And just this idea that you are just entombed with this horrible, again, hands everywhere, screaming faces, again, just Ugh. like, can't, and you're just trapped. You can't help your party as well as this huge creature, with bits falling off it. And again, it's, it's sort of, what I see as a, sw it is a swarm of zombies, but it's just a clot. What a, what a word, clot. I just, yeah. Yeah, what a oh. word. Yeah, you could get very descriptive with those things having mm. their claws all around you and not being able to breathe, not being able to scream just because you're completely covered. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, interesting. The flesh that you become entombed in is a large object, AC 10, 25 hit points. So depending on how strong your party is, this is a CR6 monster. It may take like a couple people's turns to hack mm. through that ball of flesh to free you. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's while this thing is still coming after you. So mm -hmm. quite a quite a sacrifice you have to make to save your party there. And even then, there is, it has something called deadly stench. So a creature that starts a turn within 10 feet must succeed on a constitution saving throw or take poison damage and be poisoned to the start of the creature's next turn. So that's disadvantage on attacks and everything. So the idea is this horrible putrid smell. And again, you could be very descriptive about it as well. It's what I would see again, the idea of you going to save a town, but it's too late and they're being overrun. This idea of the apocalypse starting to happen, the, the walking dead. Again, this creature running in the background because you've made a noise somewhere, like someone's uh, dropped uh, a glass in the tavern that's been abandoned. And you look and you just hear this horrible scream as whatever it is, is coming around the corner. And again, I'm sort of doing the actions here, but obviously no one can see it. This idea of almost like a gorilla type form just pulling itself along as a huge roll yeah. of mass of bodies just... And then when it gets to the building you're in, they start pouring through all of the windows and doors back into the clump again, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned World War Z where there's it's like that wall of zombies coming up over the wall, you know, like this huge clump of them all crawling. That's, yeah, you could do a lot of crazy imagery with yeah. this. It's And it's 40 feet of movement as well. So fast than most player characters are probably going to be as well. Unless you are, yep. they're double dashing, they've got flight or something. It, this thing's going to catch up to them because they're just, again, like you said, that idea of just really fast, sort of like crawling, screaming ball of mass. Yay. <laughs> Perfect. The good news is that in Flesh and Tomb is a recharge thing, so yes. it takes a five or six to recharge it. So a third of the time you'll you'll be able to use that, but quite the quite the encounter there. Mm-hmm. All right. So penultimate pick. What are you going for, Derek? 
Ooh, penultimate. That's a great word. <laughs> I have gone with, again, in Volo's Guide to Monsters, page 192. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the Dungeon Dudes for introducing this terrible beast to me, which is the spawn of Kius. Mm-hmm. I looked up the pronunciation because I... I have been calling it Caius, uh, so I'm not sure which I prefer, but Spawn of Kius. Apparently, Kius is some sort of deity of death and disease. Yes, so I, I'm so from. glad you pronounced it because I definitely would not, I would have got it wrong completely. This, again, another one from Orcus as well. Really interesting. I know, I, I must be chaotic. I, 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 I don't know if I've got a type or what, but you know, here we I, are. I don't know. This, uh, his, his mantra of anything living must become undead, it's very horror vibe. So I, I, I understand why he'd get a second one into, into this uh, top six of yours. Yes. So I love these most of all because I have used them before Uh, i don't think i've used any of the well i have used slot that's a lie but i have used spawn of kios before and i loved it because it's so unexpected so yeah i put them in a wizard's tower with a necromancer at the top as you do Mm -hmm. and this is what it says in the second paragraph here from a distance or in poor light, the spawn of Kios looks like an ordinary zombie. So your party's like, oh, no big deal. You know, we know how to fight these things. They're not that hard. As it comes into clearer view, one can see scores of little green worms crawling in and out of it. These worms jump onto nearby humanoids and burrow into their flesh. A worm that penetrates a humanoid body makes its way to the creature's brain. Once inside the brain, the worm kills the host and animates the corpse, transforming it into a spawn of Kios that breeds more worms. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I, yes, in the encounter I used these on, I have a party that is... It's got a fighter and a barbarian. They both run in gung ho, oh, no. you know, ready to oh, no. kill another zombie. And both of them took many worms uh, before they realized that they had to kill them and get them off themselves before they would, you know, become one of these things themselves. So I, I love the the gotcha moments. I love the not tricking or fooling your party, but things are not always as they seem. And that's that's really kind of the, the point of having these things in a, a horde of other zombies or in places where zombies might be. Going from sort of like animated armor to helmed horror uh, to zombie to this, it makes total sense. The idea is like, all is not what it seems. It's not as easy as you think. Again, not necessarily tricking the characters, but tricking the players and like going, hey, don't second guess this. Like this is take. I guess you're right. It's I. I would see it as like, hey, I've surprised you now. What else could be different? And just I guess mm-hmm. it's just a way of like shocking any expectations and just be like changing them. And I love that as a player. Like I, you know, make assumptions about certain monsters, but ultimately I'm like, I've never heard of this one before. I've not seen this. And yeah, looking it up again, horrific image in my head. I would describe it as as soon as it comes into some like it is just worms in some sort of form. I can't remember the demon's name now, but in Constantine, the film, there is a creature made of all these little bugs and stuff like that. So it instantly had that sort of thing. Mm. It's just wearing like a cape of some sort. And as soon as he strikes out at it, it just you know falls apart and there's rats and all that sort of thing. So that's uh, that's what I got here was this idea of like a, a rat king or a worm king of some sort. Was, blah, no thanks. Yeah. So to quickly break down what makes it so terrifying, uh, 10 AC, 76 hit points, so much more than your standard zombie would have. Mm-hmm. Each turn, it regains 10 hit points unless it is in sunlight or in a body of water or if it has taken acid fire or radiant damage. Mm-hmm. So paladins and clerics will make quick work of them, but otherwise they, you know, they're know, they going to be regenerating each turn and gaining back the hit points that you're taking them down. It makes two attacks each turn, with its claws and then it can use this burrowing worm effect so two claw attacks plus six to hit six damage on average plus seven necrotic damage so that's 11 per hit not incredibly damaging but no. you know the real problem is when this worm jumps on you so a worm launches from the spawn of Kios at one humanoid and the, the spawn can see within 10 feet the worm latches onto the target skin unless the target succeeds on a dc 11 dex saving throw again your barbarians probably have higher decks, but your fighters, your paladins, they're not going to have incredible dexterity. And so mm-hmm. it'll be pretty easy to get these things to jump onto your players. And the worm starts burrowing on the next turn. So your players have to take an action to scrape this thing off their skin before it starts digging in. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's inside you and you can't get it out. 
Yeah. It's one of those things where depending on how you describe it as a DM, I would do it as neutrally as possible. Maybe you instinctively would want to shove it off, but maybe you're like, no, I need to fight. And the player may forget to say, with my free action, I shrug it off or something like that. And that's the yeah. thing. As soon as you go, oh, on its turn, it burrows into your skin. And you're like, wait, what? I thought I, and I know a lot of players are that sort of thing where they are, they're very like, I do this, this, and this, and make sure about it. And that's the thing. I think that first couple of rounds where they might forget because they're, oh, well, we need to finish off the creature. And you're like, oh no. Yeah, just kill it. Yeah. But yeah, we'll, we'll just kill it. Don't worry about this. This is fine. It's like, no, this is the danger sense. Like you, it's about, it's similar to like, you know, vampire bites or zombie bites is that sort of thing where we know, obviously them reaching out, like, oh, well, we don't want them to touch us. But I guess maybe not, maybe, oh, it's just a green worm and you don't see it in the light or, oh, you're too busy, all other things. And yeah, oh, love that as a, yeah. as a concept. It's great. It is, it is. And yeah, like I said, the encounter went exactly as I hoped it would, yes. where my party freaked out and realized how terrible they were going to be and still talk about it to this day. You know, like, oh, remember those terrible worm zombies? So very memorable and uh, yeah i really enjoyed throwing them at my players that's the best kind of encounter it's one that they, they repeat back going man this is not as bad as that encounter and you know you've done a good job as a dm when they say that yep. so good job there derek your second to last pick for us fiona right okay so we've had the horrible worms we've had the zombies we've, we've gone through zombie 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 so we're going to go through a similar type of zombie <laughs> we're going to do some <laughs> we're going to look at jianxi and they're described in the chinese folklore as hopping vampires but i see them more as a sort of a hybrid between vampires and zombies i think there's like a they've got bits of both so and jianxi in general i highly recommend people having research on chinese folklore as well and actually folklore that's beyond sort of like North America and UK. And certainly for me, obviously, I, I have a very Western European sense of, of horror stories and stuff like that. But actually, mm -hmm. Asian folklore horror stories is fascinating and really interesting. So I would highly recommend checking them out. But yes, Jianxi, when a soul becomes trapped within its corpse, the bitterness can reanimate its body. What a line. Again, that idea of vengeance evil it's anger and i think that's the thing we don't get in horror anymore maybe there's too much about oh it's gory or it's um it's scary it's a jump scare no it's about emotion and i think all good stories have an emotion mm. attached to it whether it's a sad emotion like you know fear or or sadness or an anger a uh, one prone to violence like a yeah you know, obviously things like like poltergeist or something like that versus a film like the others for example so they stalk the descendants and communities that they knew in life. So the idea that you could go as a, as a venturing party into villages where they don't talk about it because their ancestors come at night to make sure that they're inside in curfew and anyone that's caught outside or been disrespecting them because they've not done as they believe they should have, they've not done the correct burials, etc. That idea, again, that folklore, that story going throughout uh, your villages in your campaigns would be just really, really interesting. The key sort of story flavor to put in this, though, is that rigor mortis notoriously affects the limbs of the Yitjanshi, causing them to hold out their arms rigidly and to walk in a stiff gait. So again, you're thinking of, obviously, going back to Western zombies, that idea, like, sort of like holding out there. Here, Jianxi are very similar, but again, with their legs as well. So that is why this idea of hopping, so this idea of something just jumping towards you at irregular intervals just always coming out behind you with the arms outstretched just what an image just yeah love it yeah i feel like western zombies are constantly like limping or stumbling or you know it's very weird irregular gait but this is interesting it's almost again kind of doll or marionette like that they mm. would have these stiff limbs i kind of think about you know, if you try to walk with your legs perfectly straight, you kind of have to swing them out in strange ways. And it would just be a weird, a very weird image seeing this thing at night yeah. and it yes. being dark enough that you can't tell who it is and why they're walking like this until they get close enough to you for you to realize what you're encountering. So very strange, strange way that they move. And it would be cool to describe that. Yeah, and again, yeah, that sort of second guessing the players going, oh, is this a person? And yeah, the idea of irregularly hopping forward, that sort of almost like a fast yeah. forward motion, like they're here in front of you. But the main mm -hmm. thing about Jianxi is this ability to life drain, essentially. And when they drain 
these vital energies, they become stronger. And so again, that's sort of that's where the sort of vampire sort of mythology comes into it. So they have an action called consume energy. It draws energy from a creature within 30 feet. If target makes a constitution saving throw, taking some necrotic damage on a fail state or half on a successful one, the Janshi regains hit points equal to the amount of damage dealt. After regaining those hit points, the Janshi gains the following benefit for seven days. So oh. that's the thing. So its walking speed is increased to 40, currently at 20. So it doubles its speed, which is terrifying in itself. And it gains a fly speed equal to its walking speed and can hover. So that sort of thing where you can imagine like maybe people taunting it going, oh, you're right, mate. Okay. And it drains the energy out of somebody. And then it does a Dalek and starts to hover and then goes straight for you flying as a, as a result and equal to its walking speed. So it's 40 feet of fly speed yeah. as well. Just chasing you down yeah, the, alleyways, just oh, scary. The art uh, is shows the billowing robes and its feet kind of dangling as it's floating. Mm-hmm. I again, you could kind of describe it floating down alleyways or something like that. Just really creepy. The robes billowing, the hair billowing in the moonlight. Then its arms are just kind of straight out, and then it uh, you know dashes towards you or something. I'll say as well, if a humanoid is slayed by the damage, it rises up as a white. The, at the end of the next turn. So you don't get much time to, to change that or to regain someone back, and it immediately acts after Janshi. But then if that white slays a humanoid, uh, so again, kills another member of the party or a minor character, then it transforms into a Janshi five days later. So again, the idea of um, grabbing someone, regenerating, making them come back as an undead, but then if they go and kill something, they go up one. So it's a mixture of that sort of um, the slard and the other one that you said, which I can't remember, but yes, it's just it's just an interesting concept where it's going to keep infecting people, keep going, and just terrorize these villages essentially. It's it's like a, a zombie pyramid scheme. Yes, man, that would be hilarious. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what a one shot that would be. The final thing, just to mention before we move on, is that this is the one stat block I see which talks about weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, sort of in addition to sort of uh, obviously condition immunities, etc. So it has a fear of its own reflection, susceptible to holy symbols as well. So again, it's like including stuff from this folklore. And again, it reminds me of obviously like you think of maybe like Bram Stoker's vampire. So you're thinking of maybe um, you know garlic, running water, having to pick up seeds or do nots, etc. And that's not in the general stat book, but this is in here. And I like that. Again, you're building mm-hmm. it into an encounter or a scenario which could help the players like for example they're they're cowering inside a a village uh in a tiny house of some sort and they just so happen to move a mirror and the janshi runs away because he can't stand its own reflection or you happen to have the the paladin or the cleric with the holy symbol that sort of is on the chest and they sort of go away from that as well so i just think it's the first time i've ever seen that in a stat block. And I, I I wonder if it's because it is the Jianxi, because it's from uh, Chinese folklore, that they want, hey, we actually want to reflect more of that and help that as a role-playing thing. I really yeah. like that as a, as a thing. I thought that's quite cool as a weakness, as a role-playing thing rather than the mechanics thing. Yeah, I feel like we would all do well to try to include more of that kind of stuff to help the players be creative. Yes. Uh, I definitely try to give them ideas about weaknesses or, you know, once they have fought a similar kind of enemy, they kind of form a strategy or whatever. I, there's there's a lot to be said for that as role playing. All right, all right. Final final monster from you, Derek. What is it? What have you picked? I have picked the Aboleth. This is Monster Manual page thirteen. Mm, unlucky so, for some. Indeed. So. The Aboleth is fascinating to me. I know it's a monster that's been part of the D&D lore for a long time, but it's got a lot of interesting information on the following page about its lair, about regional effects. Mm. So let's dig in. So Aboleths, they're entities that are older than the gods, and they were kind of supplanted by the gods of whatever universe you're in and have kind of retreated down below, whether it be in the ocean or, you know, in dark, deep caves below the earth, because uh, the gods have kind of driven them there. So it talks about them having really ancient memories and kind of plotting the demise of the gods at all times. And that's kind of what their goal is. It also kind of reminds me a bit of Mind Flayers, you know, Mm. having been driven down below by the Gith and are now plotting to try to bring back their society to dominance, but kind of in different ways. Again, we're always going to say the imagery of this, like a squid-like 
fish-like creature with no eyes and a lot of teeth. You go, hmm, no thank you. I see, I instantly see like almost like a jaws s type encounter at this point. You're like, oh, I think we need a bigger boat. Oh God, we, we need to get out of here. We don't forget the yes. boats, you know? <laughs> so Avalis are challenge rating 10, mm-hmm. but with a lot of caveats in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about their lair and the regional effects. So yes. I'm going to do region first because as you are getting close to them, these are the things you're going to notice. So within one mile of an Aboleth's lair, underground surfaces are slimy and wet and are difficult terrain. So that's very interesting. Difficult terrain, you know, you're moving slower. It'll be harder to stay up on your feet if something happens. Mm -hmm. Water sources within a mile are supernaturally fouled. Enemies of the Aboleth that drink such water vomit within minutes. So unless it doesn't hate you, you can't drink any water around it and it'll, it'll just make you sick. And then the third and most interesting one to me is as an action, it can create an illusory image of itself within one mile of the lair. The copy can appear at any location the Aboleth has seen before, or one of the creatures that have been charmed by the Aboleth has seen before. So that brings me to kind of the next point, which is one of the things that the Aboleth can do is charm people into becoming its slaves. And it can do this three times a day. Yep. Yep. And oh. Once you are charmed, you have to wait until the Aboleth dies or has been moved to a different plane of existence before you yeah. are freed from its grasp. Yeah, there is no, you can't save at the end of your turn. It's not like a, oh, wait an hour, wait 24 hours. No, it's either it dies or it's moved from your plane, you've moved or something like that. The fact you're under its control, can't take reactions. And again, it's that sort of thing where you're telling the player this and you have, you know, maybe communicating through text or something else to yeah. like indicate that something's wrong. Like the only chance that people can can help your charmed friend out is for if it takes damage, then you can repeat the saving throw. But it depends on how willing you're willing to do that. Because again, the Aboleth, you might not see it. It might just disappear. And just the idea of it controlling you, it will be very keen to protect that person so that he doesn't lose that connection because it again yes. this this idea of right, it likes to be worshipped and you must sort of grovel before it just oh horrible yes it's a dc 14 wisdom save not a lot of um 5e characters are probably going to make that depending so quite a difficult save as well so those are the regional effects and you, you kind of mentioned or I, I mentioned the charmed people so i envision it having like an army of these people that have wandered down gotten lost and then just been taken over by it so it's got this creepy army that just wander these tunnels of this cursed underground lair that's all slimy and gross and you know they're just kind of there doing its bidding the lair actions are also very interesting it can cast phantasmal force with no components on any number of creatures that can see within 60 feet of it. Pools of water within 90 feet of it can surge out like a grasping tide and you have to make a DC strength save throw or be pulled into the water. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the water in its lair is a conduit for its rage and it can target any number of creatures within 90 feet and you have to succeed a DC 14 wisdom save or take psychic damage. So it's almost like an alley-oop there. You just have to draw them in close enough to to get near the water. Then you pull them in. And if they're far enough in that they can't swim back out, then you blast them with this psychic damage. And these are all lair actions apart from the normal attacks and stuff that it's doing. Yeah, and like Phantasmal Force as well is quite a spell. Again, if running this encounter, I, in my head, lair action top of it would be Phantasmal Force, you know, if they're already in there close. So making sure that you, as a DM, reading that through and make sure you have like maybe written down some notes about what you want that to do, I think would yep. be very key. Because obviously the, like, the final two are like, give damage or push people towards you or away from you, sort of thing. whereas Phantasmal Force, it's a very cool opener. I could imagine that mm-hmm. being. So here's how I would set up this encounter. I, like I said, it'd probably be in some creepy underground chasm. I would make some MacGuffin the party has to go find or person they've got to go rescue or forbidden knowledge they need to go acquire from carvings or something. They head down, they start encountering these slimy walls. Then, you know, there's this creepy person that comes up to them, starts talking to them and tells them what they seek is further in, you know, whatever they're (laughs) looking for. So it leads them in. Then I'm envisioning the pool where the Aboleth resides and some sort of chasm or cliffs that are close to each other. Mm -hmm. And across it is the thing they need. Mm -hmm. The phantasmal force is a ghostly bridge it makes appear. And then the guide tells them to cross the bridge. 
they all fall into the water and are stuck next to this thing and then you roll initiative that's how i would do it i like that trick them into going closer absolutely yep. and because you mentioned the mucus there's also they have something called mucus cloud as well so you there's this horrible and it just calls it transformative mu- mucus that's disgusting whereby a, a creature that touches the aboleth or hits it with a melee attack within five feet must succeed on a constitution saving throw on a failure that creature is diseased for 1d4 hours the diseased creature can only breathe underwater well that's it you're stuck in that water you can't you can't leave you yeah. have to be in that water as a result looking at the aboleth as well it can go on land it's got 10 feet of movement online but obviously it's going to stay in the water that's where it is mm-hmm. but i can imagine that you get up onto the bank and you're like Oh, I'm safe. And then you just have a sudden tentacle come out, wrap you and pull you back in just like, cause it can reach you. So yeah, that enslave I mentioned earlier, about three times a day. So you could enslave half of the party or more with uh, the right kind of roles happening too. So Mm -hmm. yes, very creepy. I envision it being like a big kind of set piece encounter that is some sort of fetch quest or something that forces them to encounter this thing and have to deal with it. Yeah, that's that's how I would make it go down. But very, uh, very terrifying. I love that it's just communicates telepathically and it can make illusions of itself. So Mm -hmm. you can mess with the players a lot, talk to them, tell them whatever they want to hear or try to convince them of your plan to overthrow the gods. You know, there's all sorts of role play that you could do with this thing as well. It talks about, like, again, the description of it, this idea that it has like a photographic memory. It always remembers like the grievances against the gods. So this idea of an intelligence, sci-fi-esque sort of alien type creature that's water-based, I think that's the key thing. So it's not like, oh, the great Cthulhu-esque type thing, or it's just mm-hmm. much more. Like it looks like a horrible fish creature. I can see this happening in any part of like a high fantasy setting that you're going across the lake you're going into a deep underwater cavern this is where this yep. would be and i think that's the key thing is that you could make no reference at all to the sort of alien intelligence they might just think oh god we escaped that big fish that one time and you're like yes the big fish that will remember your faces uh forever Ugh. yeah so that's my last one, Fiona. Mm-hmm. Let's hear what you've got saved for last for us. All right. All right. So, yeah, you've ended on a quite a legendary creature yourself. So I thought, why not? Why not go for a headless horseman? Classic. You say classic. I can't remember the last time I've seen a film about it. Like, obviously, we have stuff like Sleepy Hollow. Uh, right. The Black Cauldron is the Disney version of that. This idea of a headless undead warrior that is again this idea of vengeance coming through consuming a villain and that these are decapitated hunters that just haunt these areas where they were slain and you know butchering in innocence and again back into uh, van richten so these are this is page 233 these are wicked knights they have these twisted codes of chivalry and we've talked about it on the podcast before this idea of paladins and like the fallen paladin or breaking an oath or something like that. and this is so much worse this idea that they have a code and they justify their violence and stuff to the point where even in death it still consumes them and similar to before about saying the devourer having minions and stuff and always similar things that they're i've actually not said their names that's very silly of me the dullahan i believe that's how you pronounce it these Dullahan are often rejoined by those in life, uh, those who followed them in life in the form of skeletons or whites or, or having nightmares for mounts as well. So again, this whole vision of like having the minions after wave of the wave and then the commander coming over the hill on a nightmare horse on fire as it were. So yes, the Dullahan is my final choice. And an excellent choice, might I add. Yes, I love the, well, the paragraph where it talks about them hanging out in strategic locations of the haunted battlegrounds that they frequented when they were alive, you know, so Mm -hmm. some creepy old war ground and there's ghost stories about this, this fire horse that you see, you know, every year on the full moon on this night where the the battle happened or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. There's kind of like the local legends and you see it off in the distance with this horrible undead army. And that's kind of the, the, the plot hook or something where, where everyone hears about it and everyone kind of knows don't go there because that thing is out there lurking. Yeah, absolutely. And again, as we know, uh, Wizard of Coast of their tables, this idea of this headless hunt and giving a reason why this is happening. And my favorite reason is simply that two of them, two Dullahans, are seeking the same head, both believing that they're the actual owner. Like, that is a comedy <laughs> of errors, but of 
grave horror proportions. And I just love that, that idea that there's two of them fighting. Because these creatures, again, they are challenge rating 10. So two of them, plus all these minions, this is bad. This is really bad. If your party's in the middle, like defending like the Sleepy Hollow Village, and there's two of these creatures fighting night after night. Let's have a look into it. So, you know, armor class 16, uh, 135 hit points, which is which is not bad, but we'll come to that in a second. What should we talk about first? I think we'll talk about the battle axe first, because this is, this is the bit where I was like, I wasn't sure if I was going to include them because I was like, oh, you know, I do love a good... I do love a good headless horseman, which is, I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. Why not? Uh, (laughs) I do love them. When I was looking at it, I was like, okay, this is a bit more in depth for a normal battle axe because obviously it's just a plus eight to hit. That makes sense. Here's the slashing damage, or if it's taking it with two hands, a little bit more damage, plus some necrotic damage. That sounds good. And then there's just this little little line that says, if the Dullahan scores a critical hit against the creature, the target must see, succeed on a 15 constitution saving throw, or its head gets cut off. The target dies if it cannot survive without the lost head. That's that's most most creatures, unless you're playing a construct, perhaps. Yeah. yeah your head's gone. And you know, DC 15's constitution saving throw, again, most your barbarians and your fighters will probably be okay for that because they probably have it in there. Not your wizards. No, not none of your your warlocks, perhaps. But the idea that is like, oh, your head gets cut off. No death saving throw, you're dead. Like, it's just so sudden. And that's on a critical. And could you imagine that as your opening move? You, you, you are going through the village and you just happen to score a critical on your first hit. And depending on who that Dillahan is going for, that could be their healer. And they're mm-hmm. dead. Just one yeah. opener. Maybe you try to drop hints about this beforehand. Like wherever it goes, you find a bunch of headless bodies so they know mm-hmm. to expect it. Uh, but yes, true, what, a, what, a, what a way to open it. I love the, the other attack as well, the fiery skull where it just like throws. Oh, it says it's a spell attack, but I envision it like throwing those flaming pumpkins at you or something, you know, oh, that, just, that, just yeah. like the, it's the, the headless flavor horseman. Bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. They've got legendary actions and then mythic actions, which I'll come to in a second. But yeah, legendary actions, again, it just makes another attack. Uh, Frightful presence. So if you've got your dragons from before, this idea that uh, you've got to succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be frightened, which makes sense because this is something pelting towards you with a huge, great battle axe (laughs) that's probably cut off somebody else's head. And then headhunt whereby, again, using all three of its actions, uh, you have legendary actions. So again, this is probably what you do on your opening round, perhaps. The Dullahan moves up to its speed without provoking attacks of opportunity, so 30 feet again, uh, and makes a battle axe attack with advantage. And if, if it hits, but it's not a critical hit, that's an extra 28 necrotic damage. So you are just wailing into these, this party. You just I can imagine that is like... You go in and you move. You see the other person who is like, ah, this is the person. This is the head I want. And go again with advantage. Just want yeah, to move. Just straight at him. Here's the thing, Derek. Say your party gets cocky and it's like, we've defeated it. You somehow managed to not get your heads cut off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you, you're all standing there patting each other on the back. You're like, hooray. And you used all your spells and it's had legendary resistances. You're like, it's done it. We've done it. We've defeated it. You haven't. There is a little little box that just says headless summoning, which recharges after a short or long rest, which I think is a good thing because that means you can have this encounter over and over again. This is the boss. It's just pursuing them or something. Yeah, exactly. So that when the Dullahan is reduced to zero hit points, it doesn't die or fall unconscious. Oh, no, it regains 97 hit points. And in addition, it summons these three death heads. So these horrible flying heads that are all around it. Again, like this idea of pumpkins, absolutely anything like that. Horrible gourds that are coming out within occupied space of five feet. They are under its control and act immediately after the Dullahan in initiative order. And now it says, additionally, it can now use the mythic actions. So you go, okay, let's have a look. Okay, coordinated assault. So you make a battle axe attack and then a death head goes. So like, okay, so that's... A lot of attacks. Headless whale, an echoing shriek comes from the headless stump, and each creature uh, within 10 feet must make a wisdom saving throw or take damage. And if one or more creatures fail it, the duller hand gets 10 temporary hit points. It's a lot of admin. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot. But if you wanted a Sleepy Hollow encounter of some sort, using this and you know, a few other bits and pieces and prepping it, whoa. yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, you could have it charge through town a few times, just lopping off a few villagers' heads or something Mm -hmm. before the party can finally get to it or something like that. Yeah, the temporary hit points it gains by that whale just being fueled by everyone's fear, you know, Mm -hmm. and and being able to uh, do that frightful presence as well. So you have disadvantage on your attack. Well, I actually, if you're frightened, you don't even, you can't attack it, can you? And you have to you, move you, away. No, you, you can if you can see it. So but it, you, it's, it's, it's with a disadvantage, disadvantage, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's so right. you have to look away and hope for the best. And Good thing you know the rules. Oh, no, not at all. But just to finally finish off on that, so the death heads, it's also a very interesting thing. So again, interesting lore, this idea of like maybe having trees that grow these things like fruit. Oh, keep that as an aside, because that Oof. sounds horrific. But there are actually three different types of death heads. You have the gnashing head, you have the aberrant head, I'm going to say that wrong, uh, and petrifying head. And each of them have their own special attacks. The gnashing one, again, just is a horrible sort of like gnashing. Oh, so again, aberrant, yeah. Aberrant, Sorry. yeah. The aberrant one has mind bending bites where you've got to succeed on an intelligence saving throw or it can't take a reaction to the end of its next turn which you might need if you're a wizard that wants to do shield, if you want to yep. disengage as a rogue, any of these things. And on its next turn, the target must choose whether it gets a move, an action, or a bonus action. It only gets one of them. So this idea that it's just, it's just screwing with your head, this horrible mind-bending bite as this head latches onto you. And then finally, of course, the one that I think is more terrifying is this idea of petrifying bites. Uh, succeed on a DC 10, because she's the same throw, so it's not too difficult or be restrained as you begin to turn to stone. And again, as we all know, petrification, if you keep failing it, you become petrified as a result. It does say for 10 minutes, but 10 minutes is a long time in combat. (laughs) Yep, that's enough for this to be done and dusted by that time. Your head's probably gone at the end of that, so. (laughs) That's true, a stone head. Yes, what a great, like you said, very Halloween spooky themed monster to end it on. Well done. We've spoken a lot over the last hour, yeah. but I think just to show that we obviously we know there are the traditional zombies and vampires, ghouls, ghosts, that sort of thing. But if you want to really dig in deep and try something new, these are just like a handful. I know I've only taken wine from Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft, but like you said, Volos, the Monster Manual, have a proper look in there. There might be something that catches your eye and you're like, ooh, what else can I take from it? So no, thank you so much, Derek. What a great topic for a perfect time of year. So Derek, where can we find your stuff? What are you up to? Tell us all the details. I run a little podcast called How Not to DM and Fiona will be featuring on, well, hold on. This is your episode. (laughs) (laughs) Fiona has recently featured on my show. And so I interviewed her, talked to her a little bit about her experience running lots of different TTRPGs, talked about her experience running a podcast. Uh, So make sure to go and listen to that if you haven't yet. My podcast can be found on most podcast platforms. It's just how not to DM the letters DM. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is at HN, the number two DM. So just those five characters. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, recently I have been appearing in a one shot with my friends over at two weeks, one shot. They are also a one shot podcast, a little bit different flavor of yours. Mm -hmm. So it should be releasing over the weeks of October. So (gasps) go listen to that. If you have a chance, we played through a Savage Worlds game (gasps) in a college town as kind of a mischief night. So the night before Halloween in a college town, hijinks ensue. I play a pretty funny character in that. So go check that out if you have a chance. Uh, And Savage Worlds is a great system as well. Really, really love it. Yeah, it was my first time playing Savage Worlds. I've listened to a few shows and stuff that do it, but I really liked it. It's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Other than that... Go listen to all of the other DMs Book Club episodes and what am I rolling episodes? Because you should. Uh, I love the DMs Book Club. It gives me inspiration all the time. And hopefully what we've talked about today gives you all some inspiration on how to terrify your party in a, uh, let's see, in a bonfire night one shot that you're doing next week or something like that. (laughs) Brilliant. Oh, thank you so much, Derek. And I will definitely pay you 
for that little ad there. Uh, so obviously just to round us things off, obviously my name is Fiona. I run the What Am I Rolling podcast, which is a twice monthly RPG one-shot podcast. As always, it is going very, very well. Things are happening. Warhammer's probably finished at this point. It has, because it's now Halloween. So yes, it has finished. Um, hopefully uh, Vert will be coming out soon. This sci-fi train spotting S type thing that's coming out. We've got another two-player one coming out. There's a follow-up to a Mars Colony, which we did last year or the year before. Um, it's either 39 Dark or Dark 39. I'm sure I'll remember it when it comes out. And I'm sure there's loads of other things happening so just listen i think it's really good finally go listen to dragon's duel and watch dragon's duel twitch streams too you know what that's very clever because obviously hamilton's not here so yes season three of the dms book club is now out on twitch uh thanks to our collaboration with dragon's duel and hamilton who is our now regular guest host we are streaming our normal episodes on there but they will also be available on the podcast afterwards maybe a week or so later because uh, currently as of recording i'm still finishing off season two but it's all fine because that's that's the way creatives work um, but we'll check it out we've done some episodes on the Feywild we're going to be doing stuff on the future of D&D we're going to do stuff on Critical mm. Role because obviously season 3 is now coming out at some point yep. and October Ara. 21st so it'll have happened once this episode releases I see see this is why I need somebody else to have this sort of thing saying don't talk about these these are in the past but they're, they're, they were very good when they came out but they'll be oh, they'll be splendid. later in the podcast so it's all you know I, I'm, I'm not sure if I like Matt's new style but you know and, and Sam's character was a little bit annoying but we'll, we'll see how it shakes out wow well kidding. you heard it here first you heard it here first from Derek <laughs> I've yet to make up my mind <laughs> and finally I keep forgetting this but finally we do have an offer code for Third Space mm. Gaming in a place called Burnley which I Burnley. found out Burnley which I found out Derek has actually been to and has actually been to my part of the of the universe I was going to say my part of the UK which is amazing what a small world but yes to get 10% off your first purchase from Third Space Gaming just go to the website and type in the offer code DMBC into the checkout to get 10% off your first order and that could be on apps could be anything like I said it could be on RPG books it could be on uh, dice it could be on terrain whatever you fancy I do think it's only UK only I need to double check that. So sorry, Derek. Uh, no, no, that's okay. no 10% off for you. <laughs> that's okay. I have a few affiliates and sponsors and you can go check them out in my link tree There you for go. all of us state-based people. Yeah, there we go. That's how it works. Well, until next time, friends, thank you so much for listening and we will speak to you, talk to you. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>